Thank you very much. So it's not the social school of studies, but the new school for social research, which is the place where lots of the philosophers and political scientists at the Frankfurt School, uh, when they had to leave due to the Nazis, they actually went to the graduate faculty of the new school. And for many decades, I'm only saying this because to correct the, uh, the uh, school that was just mentioned, um, it was for decades actually the only place where you could seriously study alternative economics. So both the mainstream economics as well as the Keynesian, post-Keynesian, Marxist, neo ricardian And this is really important actually. I'm glad I was given the opportunity to make this correction because very much at the center of what I'll be talking about today is that we cannot reform the economy without actually reforming and rethinking the economic theory which has misguided it. And so if we want to rethink capitalism and rethink the economy, we have to rethink economics. And hopefully I won't scare you too much, but there was this nice uh, two-page centerfold in the Times in London the other day calling me the scariest economist. And it's actually a very good article. The headline written by a man was very strange, but the article written by a woman is actually fantastic. <laughs> I just say that about the man because I think anytime you have a woman saying something too strong, she might be portrayed as scary, whereas we don't hear that word very often to talk about sort of the top economists. Anyway, but I do want to scare you a bit, and I actually want to start out with your own sector, which I understand is the financial industry. And there's two things I think you should be very, very worried about, if not scared, about the financial sector. Um, and they both have to do with the fact that they haven't been doing their job, right? So even if you just take the basic premise, which finance should be greasing the wheels of the economy, right, and actually getting things to happen by financing things in the real economy, so an in industry, whether that be pharmaceuticals, IT, or new energy, actually what we've had in much of the world is that finance has been financing finance, right? So this graph here, which is um, by Andy Haldane, who's a very, very smart economist at the Bank of England, looks at the degree to which financial intermediation, uh, which is basically the entire financial sector, including the shadow uh, banking sector and all the different forms of finance, has completely outpaced the rest of the economy. And his analysis of this is very much this issue about, you know, that finance has actually not been finding its way into the real stuff, but has just been financing different parts of the financial sector itself, which we might get to back to later. But the other thing, which is much less talked about, definitely not talked about by central banks, is this part of finance, which is the financialization of the real economy itself. Right? So what is actually happening to the profits that are being earned in some of the largest worldwide corporations, forget whether these are American or not American corporations, they're global. Um, and this is quite scary, which is that many of these companies, over 100% of their net income is being spent on areas like dividends and share buybacks. Share buybacks, as you know, can be done for good reasons sometimes, but the extent to which they're being done today is a huge problem. And one of the reasons, of course, is to boost your share price, stock options, and surprise, surprise, executive pay. Um, it's very interesting to see how the rules around share buybacks has changed over the last decades, but the extent to which it's happening today was actually illegal in the 1980s. And I'm going to come back to this issue of legality, because actually markets are outcomes. They're outcomes of the interactions between different actors, public actors of different types, private actors of different types, but also civil society, right? And how the interactions are structured and how those organizations are structured actually defines the markets we have. When I say civil society, by the way, I should just remind people, I'm sure you know this, especially in Scandinavia, but some parts of the world have forgotten, that you know things like weekends or the eight-hour workday were fought for <laughs> by trade unions, which are part of civil society. Um, and that actually formed the kind of markets we live in, the, the kind of markets we produce within different sectors. So just keep thinking back to this point about markets or outcomes. Markets are outcomes, and what kind of outcomes do we want? Well, my thesis really is we need to rethink lots of things in order to get the markets we want. And this is especially important in a world where you know, there's huge challenges. There's challenges around the climate, where if you look at any of the statistics, especially if you believe in climate change, you will realize that we're simply not spending enough. We're only spending about 
from this, these figures here, 20% of what we should be spending if we really want renewable energy to uh, replace fossil fuels. Um, there's huge challenges, challenges around health systems, around pension systems, around the whole demographic crisis, which some people talk about as aging. Um, there's all sorts of diseases for which there's literally very little investment by the pharmaceutical industry. So, you know, how can we actually, again, tilt the playing field so we actually get some types of investment that we are completely lacking? There's huge challenges out there. And the good news is that actually, in some ways, this era that we're living through is one where these challenges about, again, what kind of economy do we want has actually been talked about quite explicitly. And this is important because economic growth, as you know, doesn't just have a rate, it also has a direction. Innovation itself, which is my specialty, innovation doesn't just have a rate in terms of number of patents, amount of R&D spending, it has a direction. And really the whole debate out there, which I think is much stronger than it's ever been, is very much about this directionality. And this will come back you know, constantly then to what kind of markets will actually serve these types of directions. So what am I talking about? talking about the Sustainable Development Goals, which have actually been signed up to by more than 100 countries, talking about the so-called grand challenges, which if you go to the UN or the um, OECD or the European Commission, you'll see you know, this point about smart, inclusive, sustainable growth being kind of a key driver of the thinking in those transnational organizations. And of course, also since the financial crisis, Many countries, including the country where I live, in the UK, I'm a professor at University College London, UCL there, uh, many countries have actually started to bring back industrial strategy, which is also about directionality, right? It, it immediately starts to uh, engender the kind of thinking of, well, what kind of sectors, what kind of interactions between sectors, what kind of innovations do we want different types of sectors to be thinking about? And by the way, let me just say one thing about industrial strategy. It doesn't work when you think of it sectorally. You don't think of, you know, which are the sectors we're going to pump prime. That often leads to capture, right? Different sectors saying, oh, we need money. Different businesses in those sectors claiming to be the most in need of different types of cash. It works really well when all sorts of different sectors through an industrial strategy and different businesses within those sectors actually come together to solve different types of problems. Um, and this is actually something that I'm currently working on. I was just named the special advisor for Carlos Modas, who's the commissioner for research, science, and innovation in the European Commission, uh, to actually help him uh, form certain missions that can address some of these grand challenges. Challenges are very broad, sectors are very narrow, missions are problems through which you can actually get different sectors and different actors to catalyze innovation around. So the space race was the challenge. The man on moon uh, problem was the mission to get to the moon. It was very interesting. They required lots of different types of innovations, including in sectors like textiles and clothing. You could not go to the moon and you know, jeans and a t-shirt. So the big question today, I think, with some of this comeback of industrial strategy in the context of the SDGs and the grand challenges, or you know, what are the kind of man on moon type missions today that can help us think about the big challenges around, again, health, climate change, et cetera. And it's not gonna happen by just talking about climate change, inequality, and aging. Anyway, so this is simply to say that this is a really exciting moment, actually, given these conversations that are being had uh, worldwide to talk about the directionality of the economy, right? Not just the rate. Um, the problem is, and this is where I'm going to come back to the whole issue of economic theory that I began with, you know, what is the economic theory then actually guiding the different types of global, national, regional, and city type policies that um, different areas might be thinking about to actually get this different type of growth. Again, innovation driven growth, sustainable growth, inclusive growth. And I want to argue that actually we have a huge problem here. We literally don't have a framework through which to guide policymakers who then, surprise, surprise, might either you know, give up or even worse, get captured right, by particular special interests along the way because they kind of forget what the public sector is for in the first place. So in economics, at best, we talk about the role of the state and hence public policy as simply fixing different types of market failures. Right? So there's this idea of the market, not as an outcome, as I was saying before, about the market, and sometimes it goes wrong, 
and you know, government has to then step in to fix those problems. And where it might go wrong is when you have a public good, something like clean water or basic research, which there isn't enough investment in those areas, and so you might need the state to step in. You might have negative externalities like pollution, you need the state to step in with something like the carbon tax. You might have asymmetric information, uh, and so not enough lending to SME, so the state might have to come in and give some money to these cute little companies, right? So th this notion that you are fixing, putting bandages in different parts where the market goes wrong is incredibly problematic if we actually want to have transformational change, which actually requires public, private, voluntary organizations to think big together, to, re to invest together, uh, to take risks together, not simply, going backwards here, to simply de-risk the private sector, enable the private sector, facilitate the private sector. Just think of a marriage, a man and a woman. If one is simply facilitating the other, enabling the other, it's probably going to be a pretty abusive relationship. You know, one is going to have definitely the upper hand, right? So to tackle these challenges, which are actually really exciting, coming back to the, you know, this is an exciting context to be thinking about, I think we don't have the framework. We do have a framework to make these fixings, right, to put bandages, and that's fine if we just want to tinker along the edges. And why those words, I think, are problematic, this de-risking, facilitating, enabling, is it continues to replicate this myth, and it's a myth, it's literally a cartoon myth, this is sort of a cartoon here behind me, where some actors in the economy are kind of cool, dynamic, able, willing, and allowed, come back to this word, allowed, you know, uh, to take risks, to think big, and that's the private sector. Just think of all the great business schools out there where you take these really excellent classes in strategic management, decision sciences, organizational behavior, where books, including a book of my colleague, are written called Rejuvenating the Mature Corporation, right? Because when corporations get big, they risk getting too big and bureaucratic, and so you know, they say, hey, be careful. You have to you know, resist inertia, resist bureaucracy. Think out of the box and rejuvenate yourself. And that's because you're a value creator. You're a wealth creator. And then this other part of the economy, which is made of public actors, so civil servants, who are needed to push some papers around to get the rules of the game right, to facilitate, enable, or the, do the famous horizontal conditions, right? Um, and they're facilitating the cool ones. So if you're graduating from a top university, right, Harvard, Yale, and the equivalents of those all over the world, where would you want to work? With these guys <laughs> or with these guys? Probably here, it just looks more exciting. Right? And this creates also this self-fulfilling prophecy, which it also becomes really hard, actually, to attract top people to go into the civil service. Now, that doesn't mean that there aren't top people in the civil service. There are all over the world. But, you know, notwithstanding all the propaganda that the cool stuff is done here. And if we actually look at how some big transformations have occurred over the last 200 years of capitalism, and yes, by the way, capitalism is quite recent. It's about 300 years old. There's nothing universal about it. So we really have to understand what has worked and what hasn't. This, this, this image is one that's very hard to see historically. Um, so I wrote a book called The Entrepreneurial State, which was translated in, I think, eight different, no, 10 different languages as of last month, um, which tried to actually tell the story about entrepreneurship in the sense of risk-taking of different types of actors, of welcoming uncertainty, of being able and willing to take on big challenges, whether it was the digital revolution, the IT revolution, the nanotech revolution, the biotech revolution, the whole pharmaceutical revolution, the clean tech revolution, and all the revolutions that we might want to be seeing in the future around innovation, which continues to be the key source of long-run growth in capitalism, and that image, that cartoon image, is just hard to see historically. And yet the stories that were told about what happened in Silicon Valley, or what's happening today around Elon Musk, who up until recently I think was selling 30% of Teslas in your country, um, is a very, uh, uh, you know, these stories are very biased, they're very skewed. And Plato, who was a smart guy, the philosopher, uh, said, storytellers rule the world. And so in many ways, what I'm trying to do is, you know, tell sort of a different story, a more, uh, I would say, historically true story 
of where risk taking, where innovation, where the willingness to take on big challenges came from. And this is not, let me repeat, not about private versus public. This is actually about admitting that interesting things happen when both public and private, to be honest, few public and few private, come together and do interesting things. And the, the reason I put the German translation here is probably I will never write another book that's translated into German as Das Kapital, and hopefully you're cultured enough to know what I'm talking about. So Karl Marx, you know, his capital was called Das Kapital in German, but it's actually a really good title because what I'll be talking about in the time I have left is in fact, the capital of the state, Das Kapital de Stat, which is, let's actually look at the investments, the high-risk investments, the portfolio, literally the portfolio, the financial portfolio, in many ways that states have taken on, and I'm gonna be drawing mainly from the US simply to debunk the US model that so many countries are, also cities and regions are trying to copy. So in the UK, we have Silicon Roundabout to copy Silicon Valley, what actually happened there in terms of the portfolio of state investments. And by the way, since I just mentioned Elon Musk, uh, just shout out, I'll, I'll do a bit of audience participation as hard as it is in a room like this, but just shout out how much money you think Elon Musk, just that one guy, got from the US government to be an entrepreneur, to do his investments. So he has Tesla, SolarCity, and SpaceX. Just throw out a number. Come on, someone, otherwise I'm gonna be stuck. My time will keep passing. Sorry? 10 billion. Oh wow, that's a lot, no. Anyway, five billion. <laughs> that's still a lot. <laughs> that's nine zeros. And even just Tesla S, that one car, got 465 million in a guaranteed loan. And by the way, that's just a, a little less than what the US government spent on Solyndra. And you might know about Solyndra because they went bust. It was a huge failure. But any venture capitalist will tell you that's normal. For every success, we probably had to with, you know, uh, accept uh, three or four failures, right? So Kleiner Perkins, big VC company that invested in Genentech, huge success, but you can bet, just speak to anyone in Kleiner and Perkins, that there was lots of failures along the way. So if, big if, if you believe me by the time I'm done, that actually the state in the few places in the world, few places in the world that have achieved innovation-led growth has actually needed to act as a public venture capitalist then uh, we better also start allowing some of these failures to happen and not to put them on the front page of the newspapers as soon as they do, but also we better make sure that those failures are learned from so that they don't you know, happen too much. And that also requires states and all the structures within states to be investing in their own knowledge creation. And this is one of the biggest crises I think we have today, that because of this really skewed, problematic, limited story we tell about where wealth creation comes from, we have an increasing amount, for example, of outsourcing of the brains of the state through its different organizations. When I say the state, think of all the different organizations that might exist in any state, including the Norwegian state, not investing in their own ability to understand, to think, to create knowledge, to welcome exploration, to welcome uncertainty, to learn from failure. When you have outsourcing of the brains of government, you get a huge problem. You get dumb government. Anyway, let me move on. So this whole notion that markets are outcome means you know, markets are built, they're designed, they have to be thought about concretely in terms of the different types of organizations and their interactions. And I think this is a very interesting challenge. And by the way, this is why I'm also very happy to have founded an institute called Institute for Innovation and Public Purpose in one of the top global design schools. Uh, the Bartlett at UCL, which along with MIT has the top architecture schools. And what's very interesting about the Bartlett where they're kind of, again, along with MIT, a number one design thinking place is that you know, they're, they're actually asking people like myself to come in and use design thinking in terms of thinking about the economy. And this is very important as soon as you start talking about markets as outcomes. And so what I want to argue, though, is that if we don't get a new theory of the state, new theory of public policy, which basically is political economy, that's what political economy means, we're in big trouble. We're going to have less innovation which is a problem today in terms of if you look at how much innovation is actually happening to get us a more sustainable economy. We'll have more rent seeking, and by that I mean the ability again of public policy to be captured by different actors, including different types of public actors, but especially by different types of business interests who just ask for really regressive things like reduce my capital gains when actually that doesn't affect investment. 
Um, and Warren Buffett, by the way, is the first guy who can admit that. He says, stop reducing my capital gains tax. I don't even look at that. I invest when I see an opportunity. Uh, more hoarding and financialization, which I'll come to at the end of the presentation again. Um, and more inequality. And if you read Piketty's book, which of course you should, you'll, you'll know that we've had exponentially rising inequality since the 1970s. Anyway, so I don't have you know, a huge amount of time, but what I want to say is that there's four huge questions that have to be asked, and they're not currently being asked at all by economists. In fact, in some ways, they're asking the opposite. I'll go through these four, I'll just quickly say what they are. The first is admitting, as I've said already, that the economy has a direction. Where does that direction come from? Is it one person? You know, Kennedy, let's go to the moon. Or is it different types of debates in civil society? Is it different types of organizations? Is it through democratic institutions? What kind of economy do we want requires actually just at least admitting this point that I raised in the beginning, that economic growth has a direction. But what do we know about how this has been done in the past? How can we make sure that we just don't get up and uh, get, um, end up in a picking winners solution, which is where someone just decides, oh, let's do that. And that thing, again, is decided kind of randomly or at worst through things like nepotism or something else. Organizations, if we actually want dynamic learning organizations in the public sector and not kind of dumb ones uh, due to all the outsourcing of the brains, how do we do that? You know, how do we turn public institutions into learning organizations, dynamic organizations that can actually you know, welcome that experimentation process? Assessment, how do we assess that? You know, there's all sorts of green books around the world where the treasuries uh, evaluate uh, different types of public investments, whether it's in bridges and roads and innovation and type of education policy we have and health. Well, if we actually have public organizations that are more about shaping and creating markets, and by that I mean co-shaping and co-creating alongside the private sector, so one side not just facilitating the other, what does that mean for how we evaluate policies that normally are evaluated by whether they fixed a particular type of market failure, which I've already said is very limited, which of course doesn't mean you don't have those market failures, but it's limited, right? So how would we assess active, dynamic, market-creating policies? And lastly, since the point of the public sector is not simply to socialize risks and then just privatize the rewards, but also to socialize those rewards, not through nationalizing industry, but making sure that value is created collectively, which can be captured by as many types of citizens as possible, especially when those investments have been paid for by taxpayers, how do we do that? Right? We know how to socialize risks, but how do we socialize rewards in 21st century capitalism? So not communism. I'm not talking about communism. I'm talking about capitalism. I'll come back to that. Right, so let's do the first one. The first one's really easy, which is simply to say, actually, you know, all these big technological changes which we've witnessed in the last 200 years, it's simply impossible to talk about them unless we admit this issue of directionality. So if you look at any of these, um, big general purpose technologies, which are the ones that actually created massive increases in productivity across many different sectors, across also different parts of the economy, so production, distribution, and consumption, it would be actually impossible to understand these without understanding a very broad and deep interaction of different types of public actors across the whole value chain in the whole innovation chain. This was not done through horizontal policies, just worried about basic research, some skills, and some science industry uh, relationships. This was done by taking choices. And what was interesting was that these choices often were made precisely, as I was saying in the beginning, through missions, right? So certain problems that had to be solved, like going to the moon, <laughs> as I've already mentioned, and today the big problem, of course, is, again, you know, trying to translate this mission-oriented approach to address the big challenge which we have, which is climate change. And that activated lots of different investments across both the upstream areas of innovation, so basic research, but also downstream in terms of applied research and, 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 and uh, different sectors uh, working together on these applied areas, but also, and this is probably one of the areas that's less well known, but in some ways most relevant to your sector, early stage, high risk, patient, long term finance to the few companies, independent of size, small, medium and large, that were even willing to play the innovation game. 
This notion that somehow we have to help all these cute little SMEs, it's just complete bullshit. There's very few SMEs out there that want to innovate, okay? About 6% of SMEs do, and they have a huge problem. There isn't enough patient finance. And if you simply spray all the finance in a country towards all the SMEs, by the time it actually gets to that 6%, right, it's, it's not enough. And so the real issue is how do you identify, again, independent of size, because there's lots of middle-sized companies and some large companies that also want to be innovating, and even they have a problem, because innovation is extremely risky, most fails, you know, they need patient long-term finance. And so across the world, what's very interesting is this patient long-term finance to the companies themselves has often come from the public sector. So in, uh, in Israel, it comes through Yozma, a public venture capital fund. In the U.S., it's come through different types of um, agencies like SBIR, the Small Business Innovation Research Program, which through procurement policy, um, uh, uh, about 3% of the national budgets for defense, energy, health, et cetera, uh, uh, go to uh, firms that are actually you know, willing to innovate. Um, and in some countries, like in Germany, through the KFW, which is a public bank, through the innovation funds within it, or the EIB in Europe with its European investment funds, the EIF, increasingly um, these funds for patient long-term finance, so not the three to five venture capital cycle, but the kind of 10 to 15 year, 20 year cycle that many of these companies require, even in their Death Valley stage, has been coming from different types of public actors. So basic research, applied research, early stage finance for the companies themselves downstream, procurement policy, as well as bold demand side policies like the ones you had in Norway, which actually helped, if you want, steer consumers towards buying certain types of vehicles over others in order to reach your objectives around uh, carbon emissions in the country. Anyway, all sorts of public policies that would be really hard to understand if you were just seeing it through a fixing uh, perspective. And so this is sort of my theatrical slide, which I usually spend a lot of time, which I don't have time now to do, but basically it was precisely those types of investments which have made all our smart products, you know, including the iPhone, but not only smart and not stupid, right? So we would not have, you know, we'd have a dumb phone, not a smartphone, if we didn't have the internet, GPS, touchscreen display, the Siri voice activated system, and I could go on and on, these all came from direct public investments, not indirect investments, which are just about subsidies or tax incentives. Um, and so the entrepreneurial state kind of told the iPhone story, literally dismantling the phone and looking at the huge amount of public investments, which are simply not told um, in the stories, coming back to Plato. Um, and that, of course, affects also the types of tax policies we think that companies like Apple and others might need. Um, now, when you look at that graph here, you'll see lots of military sort of organizations from the Army Research Office, DARPA, which, as you know, came, was one of the key investors in what later became the Internet, initially was uh, ARPANET, you know, a CIA, which was one of the key investors in what later became the touchscreen display, so be careful every time you put your finger all over your phone. Uh, think about the CIA funding it. Anyway, this looks a lot like the military industrial complex, which it was. What's interesting, though, is that the U.S. actually understood, until Trump, by the way. Trump is the first one who doesn't understand this. Reagan totally understood this. So the U.S. understood that this couldn't just be limited to the military industrial complex. So if you look at the years here, you'll see the Reagan years in the 80s uh, witness also a huge increase in public direct, just keep repeating, direct, direct, so not just subsidies, not just tax incentives, to what basically became the whole life sciences sector in the US. So the National Institutes of Health, this is their budget even after the financial crisis, spending 30 billion just on this sector. That's very, you know, that's a lot of money even for the US, which is very large. Trump is the first US president ever. This is not about Democrats and Republicans. He's the first, that the first thing he did when he came into office uh, was to say, you know, why do we have these organizations like ARPA-E, which is basically DARPA, but in the Department of Energy? We don't need that. You know, we got big you know, entrepreneurs in energy. We have big energy companies. We don't need that. He interestingly didn't cut the budget yet of energy. He's simply going after the organizations that are key to green and renewable energy innovation. And so he went after uh, ARPA-E, and he very quickly also started to go after some of these, all facing close to 25% cuts. But anyway, up until now, uh, the NIH, for example, has been responsible for something like 
of the most uh, uh, revolutionary drugs. These are the new molecular entities with priority rating in the US. And there's lots of studies that prove this. You don't need to believe me. Um, this is the figure showing you what I was talking about before. So the patient long-term finance through SBIR, Small Business Innovation Research, going to uh, very innovative uh, small companies, which again are very few. <laughs> it's not true that there's thousands out there, uh, mainly through procurement policy. And if anything, this funding, this is comparing uh, SBIR, which is again a private program, to the private VC industry, which as you know is very driven by exit, exit in three to maximum five years through an IPO or a buyout. That's fine if you want to tinker on the edges. It does not get you the biotech revolution. This gets you the biotech revolution. In fact, uh, the Kleiner Perkins kind of investors came here. They literally surfed this wave. This looks like a wave. They surfed it. And one of the problems today when we don't admit this story is there's no wave to surf. <laughs> you know, you don't say, oh, we need to be like the US, let's get more venture capital. You also need to provide that wave that the VC guys can surf and then admit that they couldn't have surfed without that way, so make sure that some of the integral underneath the curve also goes back to some public funds, a point I'll raise in literally my last minute. Anyway, so in, what's very interesting is if you then apply this to the next big thing, which many of us hope will be green, the green revolution, where actually if you just look at the data, you know, forget any sort of politics behind this, just the data, if you look at Bloomberg New Energy Finance, which is probably the best database out there, on all the finance around the world that's financing something related to renewable energy, you basically see that that top right-hand quadrant is again being populated mainly by different types of public actors which are willing to take on those early high-risk uh, uh, phases which the VC industry frankly simply shies away from and tends to come in later. Um, and one of the interesting things actually about clean tech is the role of public banks call them different things in different parts of the world, um, so state investment banks, um, promotional banks, et cetera. And so that's that first big green thing there, and that's basically four banks. So that's the European Investment Bank, the KFW, the Brazilian Development Bank up until two years ago, then it basically stopped because of what's happening in um, Brazil, and the China Development Bank, one of the biggest investors. And they're very important also for the diffusion and deployment of existing renewable energy techniques, because, and don't forget diffusion and deployment is just as important as the upstream um, R&D because otherwise you, you, you get new technologies but they don't actually float throughout the economy. So the KFW, this is their figures, uh, this is the German public bank. What's very interesting is they're acting both as a counter cyclical bank, which is what we all know public banks should be doing. So after the crisis, private banks withdrew credit and people called it the credit crunch. Um, whereas public banks increased it, but this is doing more than that. It's not just counter cyclical, it's also directing the investment towards basically energy vent, energy vende, which is the big vision in Germany for transformation of the whole economy. This is not about offshore wind or solar panels. This is about even getting steel. The steel industry in Germany has completely transformed itself, lowering its material content through repurpose reuse and recycle, and they needed patient finance as well to do that. This is why I keep going back to this issue of cross-sectoral you know, interactions to, uh, to address problems, but also you know, forget size. It's not about size. Small, medium, and large companies, the few that are willing to transform themselves will need patient finance. Um, the China Development Bank, huge <laughs> amounts of funds. Lots of these investments fail but you know, lots have paid off. And of course, in some ways, what happened to Solyndra is interesting for two reasons, both in terms of the money that they also got from the US government, and I've already mentioned again the five billion just to the Elon Musk kind of investments, but Solyndra is interesting also because it went bust precisely due to the uh, lowering of, uh, uh, of silicon prices, which partly were due to this massive scale of investments that occurred in China. Um, the big challenge, I think, for China today is whether this becomes a bit too clunky. What we know from Silicon Valley is that what was required was not just a huge amount of public investment, but it was a um, decentralized network of different types of public actors along that whole innovation chain, alongside the private ones, of course, as well. It wasn't just one big you know, innovation agency, top-down, big brother funding everything. There was SBIR, National Science Foundation, DARPA, NIH, et cetera, National Nanotech Initiative. There was lots of different public actors. So whether this kind of system of innovation and decentralized network of different types of public and private actors 
will emerge in China, I think, is a big uh, question for its own future, because we know from the Soviet model it doesn't work when it's sort of just top down and clunky. Anyway, organizations, how do we build more dynamic learning organizations? Well, first of all, we need missions, right? If the organization itself just sees itself as facilitating, it's probably not going to play a very interesting role, but they also have to form their internal structures that welcome uncertainty. If you look at how DARPA does it, it's fascinating. We should not be cutting and pasting that model. Every country will have its own cultures and context, but you know, making sure that you're public but unpolitical, right? so not uh, vulnerable to the political electoral cycle is key, right? And so in the book, again, I go through kind of those stories and what we should learn from them. Italy, for example, had a huge public enterprise, EDI, which had three phases and the only successful phase when it was public but unpolitical. When it was public and political, it failed. When it was privatized, it failed even more. And this is very important. We should understand what kind of public, not public or private. Anyway. Um, when, I, when I asked, actually, Cheryl Martin, who was one of the first directors of ARPA-E, how does she do it, her answer was fascinating. She said, we measure our success, again, public actor, ARPA-E, by how many risks we were willing to take, but also by how much impact our successes have, right? So they were actually responsible for the biggest innovation around battery storage before Elon Musk. Um, and that had huge impact, obviously, across the economy. But how, you know, how do these organizations work? This is actually the key question we're asking, again, in this institute that I've set up at UCL, where I'd love it if you all sent other students, but especially civil servants in Norway should come, because we're planning on setting up a whole master's in public administration, which completely reverses the curriculum, which currently is much more predicated on getting civil servants to worry more about government failures than market failures. Anyway, that whole process of trial and error, experimentation, bottom-up experimentation, not top-down directions, is hard to do, but it's doable. But it's only doable if we even ask the right questions. Assessing, how do we assess uh, public policies that are you know, both mission-oriented and actively shaping and creating markets? This quote here, which you don't have time to read uh, from Keynes to Roosevelt, I think is fascinating. Because what he basically says, I'll summarize it for you, is we don't have lions and wolves and tigers in the business community. We have domesticated animals, you know, gerbils and hamsters and pussycats. Um, and that's a problem. He's, he's writing after the biggest financial crisis in history. Because if they were willing to roar and all you had to do was create a little incentive through taxes or interest rates, that would be kind of easy. If you have domesticated animals who don't even want to roar, the big question is, how do we get them excited? How do we actually get the business community to want to invest when they're not investing? And that question, I actually think, modern-day Keynesians haven't really answered. It continues to be this notion of counter-cyclical government and different types of tax policies, more or less spending. Is austerity good? Is austerity bad? But the question of how do you get business excited about, you know, those are going to be the cool sort of new opportunities, technological and market, which then get them to invest. How, how you do that is much harder. And looking again historically, which is I tr what I try to do across all these different sectors, look at the kind of investments that were required by public actors to actually then create dynamism and excitement and the willingness to invest in the private sector, that just simply has not been researched enough. And so creating a new market, not just fixing an existing one, we need to also be able to measure that arrow. Otherwise, as soon as you do get ambition in the policy community, you're immediately told you're crowding out the private sector because you're being a bit too ambitious. Again, I don't have time to go into this too much. This would re require you know, a two-hour lecture because the whole issue of how do you measure public value, how do you measure market creation and shaping, not just market fixing, is huge. Um, and this whole kind of difference between countries of how they use public money as, you know, just for subsidies and through indirect mechanisms, which are these blue lines here. This is showing you the amount of public money uh, helping the private sector spend on R&D, research and development, so BIRD, business R&D investments, and, and how public funds across the world are spent through direct versus indirect. These direct, uh, which are the, the, the white versus the blue, shades here, funding that I've basically been talking about, you know, the DARPA, NIH, KFW investments are direct. We have to understand both the levels and why the blue lines are not enough, incentives are not enough, but also the structure. 
And in fact, if you look around the world, those countries that spend the most in the business community in R&D are also those that have been willing to, you know, again, co-invest, invest directly, not just subsidize. Um, lastly, this whole issue of inclusive growth, you know, that requires sharing risks and rewards. How do we do that? I think we actually need new contracts. We have very problematic contracts where you have, you know, companies like Novartis working for free, for free on the International Space Station and patenting, <laughs> patenting publicly funded technology on a publicly funded infrastructure. You know, who thought that up? That's not very, it's, it's, it's not very smart if we want these public funds to replenish themselves. By the way, it's not that hard actually if tax was what it used to be, last audience participation. What was the top marginal taxation rate under a Republican military general president, Eisenhower, when NASA and DARPA were founded, right? NASA and DARPA have been critical to all US innovation investments. What was the top marginal taxation rate under a Republican president in the US? Just yell it out. You got it wrong before, so you're not allowed. <laughs> Numbers? So, sorry? Yeah, very good, 90, someone said 90. 91 actually, 91%, right? So just to say we're in a different time. I'm not gonna argue we should go back to that time, but we are in a very different taxation regime time, right? So this whole issue of how do we actually get back some of the rewards to come back to the public sector when we take on these big risks? It's not that big of an issue if we're talking just about basic research, because actually the rewards come back through new knowledge and that spills over. But these direct investments in companies like Tesla, does it just come back through tax or should we think about it? So I'll stop in just a second. So this whole question is about inclusive growth. There's no point in pretending you're interested in inclusive growth unless you're willing to ask that question. And um, this is actually gonna be central to a new book I'm writing which I won't bore you with but you should buy it when it comes out. But this is what Piketty I think sort of missed in his story which is that this very high rise in inequality that is not just because you know, some are not paying uh, too much tax and we just need to tax the wealth. If you look at all sorts of changes in taxation regimes, including the reduction in capital gains tax, that occurred through a narrative and a discourse of who the value creators were. So in the US, surprisingly, it was the National Venture Capital Association that lobbied for capital gains tax to fall by 50% in just four years. Um, and it's, again, it's Warren Buffett who often says, stop, I don't even look at capital gains, I look at opportunities. And many of these public investments were precisely funding these opportunities. Anyway, so what can be done? Because we are, this was the first graph I showed you before, in an era of record level hoarding and financialization, as well as very strange contracts like the Novartis case I just mentioned. And I think, and this is my last slide, that there's very concrete ways that we can rethink the distribution of risks and rewards once we admit that risk taking is a collective process, right? So even the share buybacks, you know, that's a lack of investment back into production, back into innovation. And Bell Labs, which was one of the most innovative organizations in the world, really, in the private sector, actually came out of government forcing AT&T to reinvest its profits in order to maintain its, mon its monopoly status. Same thing with patents. We used to only give patents if then the public side got back its reward for giving a 20-year monopoly, right? And yet what we ended up doing is allowing lots of publicly funded research to be patented, which is fine because that kind of helps commercialization, but we haven't been careful about making sure that what's being patented, which should just be downstream, not upstream, isn't blocking the innovation process itself. So this is really about rethinking the public-private contract about conditions on reinvestment, what should be patented to make sure we, we have diffusion and deployment once these patents are up, patents are up, and also maybe allowing the governments to retain a golden share of the patents, but also admitting that we need this das capital, this stat. So perhaps some of these companies like Google, whose algorithm, the Google algorithm was funded publicly, actually reinvest back into these same public funds that they require. And unless we completely rethink this cartoon image where I began with, none of these changes are gonna occur because Plato was absolutely right, which is the stories, the stories, the discourses we tell about who the wealth creators are matter. And they are currently helping some to get richer, not only 
others to not get richer, but also really hurting the planet we're living on in terms of not benefiting from the kind of innovations we've seen drive growth in the past. Sorry, I went over time, but it was good, wasn't it? <laughs> I have a lot of questions, however, in the interest of time, um, I think we'll boil it down to one question that I hope uh, can maybe summarize for a lot of investors here today, um, and that is the role of the small and medium-sized businesses. I was quite surprised to hear that only 6% are interested in, in innovation, really, um, which is really the opposite of what you, what you read about in a, in a lot of the, the media. Now, given that SMEs, small, medium-sized businesses, make up 99% of European businesses, how do you, as an investor, potentially identify those businesses that are willing to innovate? That's a very good question, because what you don't want to do is ex ante think you already know, and then, again, that's just a different type of capture. So first of all, you know, there's no evidence, actually, empirically, that size matters. Age does, I mean, often it's young firms, right? But many of the policies that we have, like in the UK, we spend more on SMEs actually than on the universities. We spend about eight billion uh, pounds just on different types of support for SMEs when actually most are not productive, they're not innovative, they don't even produce net, net job creation, right? So by actually forming ecosystems, which are, you know, have both, if you want, upstream financing of innovation, downstream kind of science industry linkages like the Fraunhofer's of this world, but also that patient finance more downstream towards any companies that are willing to engage with the big innovation challenges, then the question is to pick the willing. You don't pick winners, you pick the willing. And who's willing to engage? Well, there's all sorts of different ways that you can actually design policies, whether it's through grants or, um, you know, price schemes, but that's more if you want on the public side. I think what has worked on the private side, and this isn't necessarily a good thing, but this is just sort of a fact, that when you are able also to identify very smart public actors that are providing that much earlier finance, like SBIR, you can then yourself surf that way because that becomes a good uh, a metric for a company that has proved itself right, through an SBIR or YASMA kind of scheme to get that very early stage financing because most of the financial actors probably in this room are not coming in in the super early phase. You're coming more in the sort of um, later kind of a seed stage. Um, and so what, for example, the venture capitalists have done in the U.S. is precisely come in after SBIR already gave a pot of money. So this is sort of like a tip, if you want. It's not one that I think actually works too well in terms of the future of some of these societies. Ideally, you would have both public and private together lending in that very early stage. But currently what we have is, again, some of these private financial uh, 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 actors coming in sort of after some of the very early uh, ones do. But I think the issue is simply just to stop worrying about size. I mean, the example I gave of steel. Steel in Germany is doing fantastic things that it's not doing in the, U in the UK. Where in the UK we think we can just again think of different types of SME policies and then green taxation policies to get a green revolution versus saying, hey guys, you know, who's willing? Who's willing to play this game, whether it's in steel, whether it's renewable energy, whether it's in transport, to play the kind of green economy game formulated around particular problems. And then those companies that are willing to co-invest their own funds will get you know, particular types of support. And the small companies need more support, but it's not because they're small that they're good. <laughs> and so you need to devise schemes that then identify those that are willing. Excellent, thank yeah. you for clarifying that. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much, Professor okay. Masakato. Thank you.